Um, first, I'd like to say welcome. Uh, I'm Jessica Hollander. I'm the Associate Director of Experiential Education here on campus in our Leadership, Innovation, and Liberal Arts Center, Myla. I'm also an alum. The series of presentations focuses on partnering with students and blended learning initiatives in the form of hands on experience and competency based approaches through collaborative methods. Jennifer Jarson and Jordan Noyce discuss the development of a peer digital learning initiative grounded in fostering student agency and growing digital literacy skills that train students to serve as tutors for digital learning projects. So, uh, my name is Jen Jarson. I'm a librarian at New Ember College. Uh, this is my colleague, Jordan Noyce. She's an instructional technologist also at New Ember. We're here today to talk to you about um, the peer digital learning initiative that we've been growing at New Ember, particularly in the past year. And the first thing we want to do is acknowledge what a collaborative effort that growing that peer digital learning initiative has been. Jordan and I are here to represent our collaborative work. Our colleague, Jenna Azar, who joined us just a moment ago, taking photos <laughs> has been instrumental, as well as two other colleagues who are here at the conference, and perhaps you met them um, in earlier uh, moments today, Tim Clark and Laura Tao. So this has really been a collaborative effort, and we want to make sure and acknowledge that work. Um, so we thought it would be useful to give you maybe just a little bit of institutional background to set the stage for why this, why we embarked on this initiative and why we think um, it is a, a, a good fit for our institution. So in recent years, um, strategic planning at Muenberg, which I don't think I mentioned, is a small liberal arts college about an hour, hour and 15 minutes north of here in Allentown, Pennsylvania, if you're not familiar with us. Um, in recent years, our strategic planning has identified digital learning as a potential growth opportunity. Um, and so we've been doing, well, we've long been doing digital learning work that sort of renewed the vigor, I guess, and gave us money to work on digital learning in new ways. And so, of course, as, um, as at many of your institutions, I'm sure digital learning can mean many things. So some of our biggest initiatives have really been about promoting faculty development around digital tools and pedagogy, developing blended and online courses um, in particular, and then related infrastructure and staffing changes as well. So those are some of the biggest areas. It also seems perhaps worth noting that our institution has a um, significant experience, tradition is perhaps too strong a word, but significant experience with peer learning communities. It's sort of part of our institutional culture to use students or to develop peer learning communities for students, to have students develop peer learning communities for themselves. So we're sort of capitalizing on that through this program. So we identified a student peer learning community around technology as an important opportunity to help support and grow digital learning on our campus um, in order to promote students' effective use of digital tools, to inspire innovative ways to, cre um, to produce, create scholarship, and to generally raise student awareness and investment in digital literacy and digital identity. So in our peer learning community, and of course in digital learning perhaps um, more broadly at Muhlenberg, we've identified and really tried to foreground these three themes. And these terms can mean different things to different people. So just to give you a snapshot of what we mean when we talk about digital literacy, um, here we're talking about the, um, not just the tools, not just the, the clicking, right, as has probably been a theme in other conversations today, but the larger set of skills and practices and attitudes um, that help students think critically about tools, that help students think critically about their participation in digital learning on campus and more broadly. Um, and of course, closely connected to that is the idea of digital identity. And by that, we mean helping students and others on our campus faculty and staff as well move from passive to engaged, move from um, consumer to producer, right? And think about crafting, creating, curating your digital presence online. And then wrapped up in all of that is also student agency, which we mean, by which we mean empowering our students um, in their own learning and empowering them as creators and collaborators and innovators in digital learning on campus as well. So these are sort of our core themes, or maybe even we can say core values. So Jordan and I are going to be talking about two different programs that sort of have been instrumental, foundational in, um, in our digital learning initiatives. And the first one is pre-orientation, which you'll probably hear me say PREO uh, for short. So we'll start with that one. So here's a quick timeline of year, or I should say iteration one, year one, of our pre-orientation program. So maybe your campuses offer pre-orientation programs, but just to be, wow, just to be clear, um, pre-orientation programs are four day long um, orientation sessions that happen before traditional orientation for incoming first year students. These are optional 
Um, students can sign up in order to move onto campus early. That's probably a primary motivator for students to participate. Um, and then also to meet other incoming students with similar interests. So while the seeds of our pre-orientation program certainly began before May 2016, that's when we really began uh, planning in earnest. And you can see we launched really quickly, August 2016, all of a sudden, there we went. Um, so here's a promotional image from our learning in the digital age pre-orientation. And essentially we had three major goals or worked around three major themes. One, to give students hands-on experience with digital tools, um, digital technologies that either were already being used on campus or we knew would, um, were being launched in the coming year on campus. We wanted to, thinking back to those ideas of digital identity and digital literacy, generate conversation with students about what it means to be a learner and a citizen in the digital age. Um, foster awareness of their personal agency and learning. And we just wanted to help them build community with each other and with us as well. Um, so this is a very hard slide to see, and I don't expect you to read this. This is just uh, to give you a sense of what our pre-orientation schedule looked like over the course of those four days. And by no means are we going to work through all the activities here. That would be super boring. Um, instead, I just want to give you a snapshot of how busy they were and also um, point out that those three themes I just mentioned hands-on experience with digital tools, developing their awareness um, and reflection on digital agency, digital identity, uh, digital literacy, and building community are sort of the guiding themes among these activities. So I want to show you a few highlights or snapshots from each of those themes. Be happy to share this or come back to this if you want to see it in more detail. So first, with that theme of hands-on experience with digital tools, this is our colleague Laura, who you might see around the conference, um, and some of our students. Um, so um, in this theme of hands-on experience with digital tools, um, a signature piece of our digital learning program, especially in the past year, has been the Domain of One's Own initiative, launching Domain of One's Own. And maybe you've heard of that before or haven't. Um, but essentially, Domain of One's Own gives um, students, but also faculty and staff, um, a platform that can support all kinds of tools where they can create their own digital presence. So we asked our Prio students to install WordPress, which is a very um, comparatively seamless process, um, and think about what their sites would look like. Um, and a number of the activities on our Prio schedule had to do with thinking about how and why to develop a domain, as well as hands-on time to experiment, as we can see in this photo. Um, so our videos are not currently working in our slides. So I'm just going to escape out of here for a second so that we can load a video and I'm make sure the volume is high for you. This is Meredith. We were so excited to ask some of our Creo and digital learning assistants to come with us today. None of them could. So we have some recordings of them um, so you can hear some of the student voices. Meredith was a um, at, this, at the time of pre-orientation arising senior, and um, she's graduating this weekend. Um, and she was a student leader for pre-orientation, so really helped us um, lead the program. And um, so her conversation, I'll just introduce it for a moment, really connects to the second theme that I mentioned, this idea of developing students' awareness of what it means to live and learn in the digital age. So we really tried to bring that digital literacy, digital identity lens to a lot of the activities. Um, in the previous slide, you saw students working on their domains. We kickstarted that work on domains by having a Skype conversation with Andrew Rickard. And maybe you've heard of him before. He's a rising senior, or was then a rising senior at Davidson College in North Carolina, and had published a few articles, posts, whatever we might call them. And the students read one of his articles called, Do I Own My Domain If You Grade It? Um, and the article is really about how students can be empowered by creating domains, but sort of pedagogical practices can be a barrier to student empowerment and student agency. So the students read that article and had a conversation with him, and here's Meredith talking about that. Long intro. The way of talking to Andrew Rickard would be like Skype him in, because it was really cool to see a student who had done the same work that we were doing with domains and with, um, you know, really making their own presence online, and gave all of us, I think, a foundation to understand what we could do with our domains, because we had just gotten them. So like when we Skyped with him and we kind of talked about his experiences with it and what he's worked with um, and like how what he's posted on his blog has become like bigger than just his blog, that really kind of inspired me and I think the rest of us to like work um, towards our blogs and really realize that they're more than just like another like social media account. 
So I think what's really powerful about what Meredith's saying here, and thank you, maybe what, what you caught as well, is that thinking about the larger audience of her, of Andrew's domain was inspirational for her and thinking about how she could use her voice beyond a typical social media type account. Um, and so this is just an image of another activity. So we tried to bring that digital literacy, digital identity lens to a lot of acti activities, but we also did a few standalone activities um, to really bring that into sharper focus. So this is perhaps hard to see. Um, maybe you've heard of this kind of activity before. This is what we might call the resident visitor activity. Um, essentially, we posed uh, the question to students, is the web a place to live, or is the web a collection of useful tools? Um, and we asked students to think about the tools they use on the web, the sites they visit, the places they quote unquote live, um, and make a little sticky note for each and then map them on this, on, on this spectrum. So the X axis is from visitor to resident and the Y axis is from personal to institutional. So sort of thinking about where they live, where they visit, and what that means about how they live online or, and how they participate online. So what I'll just call out a few things that might be interesting, or I think are interesting at least. This particular student's work, you'll see in the upper left corner, has made a, um, a post-it for YouTube, but also in the middle left side has made a post-it for YouTube. So it feels like, she, you know, this student feels he or she participates on YouTube in different ways. One very personal, one sort of on the dividing line between institutional and personal, or both as a visitor. That's kind of an interesting perspective. And I love this um, over here. We see a lot of social media. Twitter in the upper right corner, very personal, very much a resident. Instagram and Facebook straddling that divide, again, a personal and institutional, of both of the student feels like a resident there. So um, I think an activity like this helps us challenge maybe the conversation about digital natives versus digital immigrants, right, where we think about skills online instead of identity or instead of purpose. Um, and this, I think, gives a more nuanced approach where we can see um, how students' participation shifts depending on the context. So it really helped us bring the ideas of belonging and identity and agency to the fore. Um, last two, well, two more things before we move on to talking about the Digital Learning Assistant Program. I mentioned that sometimes we just wanted to have social activities, right, and build community. So our PRIO group hosted a dance party for all of the PRIOs. We told them they were hosting a dance party. Um, for all the other PRIO groups, there are probably six other groups at the time, six other groups, something like that. Yeah, so they hosted that, they did the planning um, and, you know, selected playlists, tried to do some promotion and so on. So infusing a little bit of digital learning into some social activities and community building as well. So um, let's just hear from Meredith one more time as we transition to talking about the Digital Learning Assistant Program. Meredith here can tell us a little bit about how she sees community building in both PRIO and... Really foster alliance. Like friendships and togetherness through this program and through building it. And I think that a lot of that came from the fact that we were all part of building it um, and building the DLA program. And it wasn't just, okay guys, here's what you're gonna do. It was, let's all sit down and talk about it and get to know these programs together and work together. And um, that really built a strong kind of sense of like identity, I guess, as a whole um, that carried, that started during free and was carried through the first year. So just to um, connect back to that or, or sort of identify the major takeaway there, right? I think Mary's saying that collaborating in the development of the programs and empowering students, sort of our attitude of students as collaborators, as innovators really helped them invest in the initiatives and, and connect with each other. And Jordan's going to tell us yeah, more. So to build off of what Mary said about the digital learning assistance program, um, while this timeline makes it seem like we had it all planned out, and we recruited them, and we had this great training, and then we just launched it, it's kind of um, not true. Uh, we had eight wonderful students say, like, we don't really understand what you're doing, but we think we know, and we kind of like it, and we're going to go along with it, and we don't think you're going to throw us off the cliff. So we were like, awesome. Good enough. Sounds great. <laughs> Um, so we quickly realized we can't get eight students into the same space multiple times a month. Um, schedules don't work that way. So we did a lot of online training. We moved a lot of the digital tools training into a Canvas website. So this involved each of us curating a particular track. We offered four tracks, digital storytelling, web publishing, um, digital archives and data visualization, and then mapping. And so each student read about, you know, read about them first and then chose a track and then followed some curated videos and documentation that we provided. And then at the end, we had them all present a tip sheet or 
a mini workshop or something to represent what they've learned and what they would played with while they were doing this. And simultaneously, they did a lot of reading. So we read pieces by Audrey Waters. I believe the next slide shows a reflection that one student did. She was an art student, so she was very visual. So she drew a lot of mind maps. And so some students chose to engage with the articles in Hypothesis. That was something we asked them, is to have a little bit of community there. And others uploaded things like this to the discussion boards to express what they got from those readings. So balancing, you know, what does it mean to intentionally use this, this tool that you're thinking about, and then how do you practically use it at the same time. And then another big part of it was they're going to be working with their fellow students, and we wanted to make sure, you know, they felt comfortable doing that. So what does peer-to-peer -peer collaboration look like? So once a month, we were able to corral them into a, a two-hour meeting where we would, you know, talk about how to be welcoming, or what to do when a student got particularly frustrated with them or the technology, and modeled those behaviors with one another through um, some great exercises that Jen brought in that just gave different scenarios of, of situations that they might encounter. So here we have two of our students um, sort of enacting that. And we're going to go to Nick here, who is another one of our senior DLAs, so leaving us as well. Um, and I just want to frame his video by saying he's going to mention Carrie a lot. Carrie is his professor. Um, and she was one of our first faculties to use Domain at One's Own, and she had each of her students use it in the blog. And so Nick, as a DLA, had his own personal domain, and then he had a subdomain that he used in Carrie's class. So he's going to talk about how he sort of made those two work together. But the, on my side, like, it was like supposed to be, like, initially I had like, this idea of, like, what I want to do. Like, I made, I made a few posts about just, like, random things. Like, I talked about Village in one year, uh, about one post, and then I talked about a couple other things. Like, I put some of my voice threads from class on there. But, but then with Carrie's site, it just kind of took over, because even though it was, like, for, like, for my actual few courses, like, it was for biochemistry, <coughs> Like a lot of my personality somehow ended up in my writing and just kind of like organization of the website. So rather than like having the two, just kind of like shifted more to just carries and then just like making that my own. And so just to pick on Nick a little bit, um, <laughs> he had some great content on his site, but he struggled with his theme <laughs> a lot. And so that was something the other DLAs would poke at him about. And I have to say, I wish I had included an image of the site he had for Carrie's class because the theme, like he finally got his aesthetic down. <laughs> so he found his voice and his aesthetic at the same time. And so working on their domains was a huge part of this because a lot of what they're going to do is help students on their domains. And so they had to develop those and find their own voice through the whole semester. And so I just wanted to show you our, our wonderful group of DLAs. You'll see that they each chose the track that they felt they were most comfortable with, even though they could all work on everything. So we had Jarrett, who's a first year and will hopefully be coming back next year. Megan, who wrote this really great post about how hard it is to be creative after so many years of having professors tell you what to do on an assignment, um, which was great. Uh, we have Nick, who we just heard from. Carl, who's our resident historian, who actually branched away from WordPress to work with Omeka. He has a rare book collection of his own, and he, he curated that here along with posts about campus. Uh, we have Jack, who's another first year business major who got really into Google Analytics. Jazzy, who is our resident artist, who has her project, The Friendly Nipple, which was like this huge social media campaign that she was working on, and she really um, worked on her site to get involved um, with what she was doing on Instagram as well. And then Dan, who is our music guy, uh, he's a business music double major, and so his is totally focused on the music that he creates. It's very simple, very minimalistic. And then we have Meredith, who we heard from earlier, who is applying to grad school, so hers looks a little more traditional in that digital portfolio style. And then I won't play this video. Um, it was exploring our space. I'll just note that one of the most important parts of building community and helping students understand what we were doing was to have this space where they could work near us if they had questions, but also have a place where they could engage with one another um, and you know, work on a larger screen. And so quickly, because I know we're running out of time, our next steps 
Um, we are doing our second round of pre-orientation. We're in the middle of hiring leaders and getting applications right now. Um, and I think the big focus there is just continuing to try to pull more digital learning assistance from that program. And just, I'll say, 10 seconds worth of something about the digital learning assistance moving forward, too. I think the huge advantage we have now is that we have somewhat of a structure, and we have returning DLAs to help us in the training of our incoming students, of incoming DLAs. And also, one thing that they really requested, actually, which surprised us, was a little bit more structure for their ongoing training. They said, you know, we want to keep growing and learning, but we don't know what it is we don't know. Can you give us some goals or challenges? So that's something we'll be incorporating more in the future, too. I'm just curious about how you incentivize this process for the DLAs. Is it a paid position for them, or is it just something they do because it looks good on their resumes? Great question. We do pay them, and the training was paid as well. So the student leaders during pre orientation were paid. Of course, the incoming students were not paid to participate, but a number of them came went on to become DLAs, and they get paid for training and get paid to staff their hours in our digital learning suite, which we call the high, as Jordan mentioned. So it is paid, but I don't think that's their only motivation. Um, I think they're motivated by their interest in what we're doing and in participating in it, too. And donuts. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> like our big tagline was donuts and domains, and right. we would host informal Friday workshops where everyone would just come work on their domain, us included mm -hmm. in the faculty community, and there would always be donuts. Mm -hmm. So, um, Never hurts to have <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.